Cool. All right. Uh, I guess we'll start. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this talk today. Thank you for uh, the Leads of Sigfony for allowing me to give this talk. I really wanted to talk about it because there's a lot of problems with Linux kernel. Uh, a bit of background on myself is that I graduated with my PhD last year. And since then, I've been running security research at Motorola. And I realized a lot about the Linux kernel and like the outside world that was not at all something I was aware of when I was at UIUC. Uh, and even back when I was at UCSD, when I finished my undergrad, uh, I didn't realize a lot of things about how exploits actually worked and what people are looking for and the current state of, of Linux kernel exploits. So today we're going to kind of break down some of the recent exploits in Linux kernel, as well as some of the current work in the Linux kernel to fix exploits and also look at kind of hopefully open up uh, the floodgates to a lot of very interesting projects and work that you can be doing or you can tell your friends about and be like, hey, did you know this about Linux? Actually, it's a big garbage fire. Um, and uh, the out, the goal of this is hopefully just to, to get more people involved in kind of working on security for Linux kernel because I didn't realize how bad the world could be. Um, that said, there's a lot of people that are trying to make a lot of uh, a lot of progress in this domain. So we'll also look at some of the approaches that are currently happening, and we'll start to look at some of the open problems as well. And it should be pretty fun. So because we've got a mixture in the audience right now of people that have a lot of background in like the Linux kernel to no background in the Linux kernel, I want to talk a little bit about how the kernel ecosystem currently functions from the perspective of Android. And we'll talk about Android because Android is slightly more advanced when it comes to Linux kernel security because it is a contained ecosystem, because it is kind of mainly Google that runs this thing called a generic kernel interface and then decides what changes go into Android and what don't go into Android. Uh, they're able to incorporate a lot of features like the KVM hypervisor into their kernel builds where the baseline Linux kernel projects that you might download, for instance, uh, Debian, are not going to incorporate those yet. You're going to be running a more kind of like raw or to the bare metal version of Linux, if that makes any if that makes any sense. Um, so, and this is also going to be the perspective from ARM. Uh, and ARM is actually very in a really interesting place when it comes to the microarchitectures and the chipsets, because Intel as they run a lot of cloud computing infrastructure, tends to be at the very cutting edge of a lot of security mechanisms and uh, essentially new features to prevent kernel exploits. And then ARM kind of follows right up with that because or right after that, because they're involved in almost everything IoT, they're involved in all your mobile devices, they're involved in the uh, number of embedded critical embedded systems throughout the world because ARM chips tend to be less power consumptive and it's just a matter of kind of historical compatibility reasons. And then after ARM, you have the other microarchitectures like PowerPC, where they, they don't even necessarily have address space layout randomization incorporated in yet. And if you're not familiar with ASLR, ASLR just moves your code to a random offset. So it's more difficult to develop uh, low level binary exploits for it. Uh, so getting into the kernel ecosystem, at least from the Android point of view, is you have kind of four, four layers to it. At the top, you have your user land processes. This is like your bash shell, your APK that you download, your internet browser. Then you have the operating system. And operating systems, the Android operating system is essentially Linux with a Java native code interface overlaid on top of it. So think of it as like Linux, and then you have individual containers for each of your APKs to enforce additional permissions. If you've ever done Android development, you know that when you write an app, you have to declare Android permissions in the apps manifest. Those map directly to Unix, uh, Unix user groups or group IDs uh, in, in most cases. There's a little bit of magic that happens beyond that, but fundamentally, it's just a wrapper that kind of makes maintaining a, a bare metal or regular Unix system more uh, uh, more 
it does a lot of the imagine it as a lot of the sysadmin work done for you is like what Android is fundamentally behind the scenes. And then for the ARM architecture in particular, there was a lot of hype like 10, 15 years ago around this thing called Trust Zone. And this is a bit that gets set in your hardware peripherals and in your CPU core. And it allows you to do more fine-grained uh, fine protection of when hardware peripherals can be accessed. So the critical one here is typically like NFC device for doing uh, like Android Pay or like, I'm sure Apple has a version of it for Apple Pay, where you don't want every user land process or every operating system process to have access to a peripheral. So you set this bit in the processor and you set a bit in the peripheral that says you can access this only when you're, when you're trusted. And we'll be going into why it turns out that like trust zone is actually now being revealed in recent years in the past two, three years to have a ton of exploits and be a total problem. Because essentially once you have that trusted bit split, uh, set, you have unfettered access to all of memory and all of the peripherals and all of that. So manufacturers like Samsung will write a trust zone application and they'll do it for say digital car keys, opening your car from your phone. And then that application will have a vulnerability. Trust zone applications might not have as, as uh, rigorous control flow integrity or defenses. And then once that application is hacked into, there's a problem. So recently, a lot more work has actually been focused and is kind of emerging at the hypervisor layer, which is uh, there's CPU privilege rings. Uh, privilege rings are execution contexts within your core that allow you to define different protection levels for memory, for resources, et cetera. User land processes are at EL0, which is the high, highest or lowest execution ring, whatever direction you want to think of it. Operating system operates at EL1. But nowadays, I mentioned KVM earlier, a lot of cloud computing, all your mobile devices, everything actually has a layer below that called EL2, which runs a hypervisor. And the hypervisor is essentially responsible for protecting the hardware peripheral devices from the operating system or for tr from trust zone, and also responsible for implementing a lot of the trust zone interfaces, because there needs to be kind of a intermediate or a mediary between the trust zone application and the operating system application. Um, so the very interesting thing that happens here is there's attacks at every single level. Uh, there's attacks that directly target hypervisor resources or peripheral devices, really, and then try to get control of the system from there. For example, the modem on your cell phone. Uh, a lot of research is dedicated to right now looking at Qualcomm's proprietary code or whoever's proprietary code for running your modem, figuring out a baseband level packet to send that could cause a buffer overflow or some exploit, and then using that to control the rest of the system, rest of the system on the phone. Um, brief aside here, because there's been recent, so you might've seen like two, three days ago, there was this Apple CPU M1 chip, uh, side channel. And they were like, this is silicon. It's impossible to break. Uh, there's a growing movement and it's been a while for, since Spectre came out in 2016 to move a lot of cryptographic operations on chips into what's called like a hardware enclave or embedded secure element. And the embedded secure element is essentially a separate chip that's only accessible by I squared C. And then you have very rigorously defined applications that run on that secure element. And that's why those like, kind of side channel exploits are, that's at least the current direction for trying to trying to mitigate them. I include this mainly because it's a hyped up thing. And I've been seeing a lot of like, not really good reporting on this in uh, Ars Technica. Um, so yes, go ahead. Um, so that chip that is isolated, mm -hmm. Is that sort of like a fan box then that you use to access processes that you're like you don't trust fully? Um, no, no, it's actually quite different. It is, it is. You have a set of cryptographic libraries and routines. You want to, you want to work with some sense of data like cryptographic keys, and you don't want it to be vulnerable to a side channel attack. So you put all the access code for those cryptographic keys and everything into the embedded secure element. You do rigorous integrity checking on those secure element applications. And then those secure element applications are only accessible through I squared C bus. And so you can enforce strong constant time programming primitives because you can essentially clock delineate when you receive the I squared C cryptographic 
uh, like results for your thing. So you'd, you'd essentially say, you'd assume that the application does not roll its own crypto and it's not executing on the main processor. That application would communicate in Android, it's called the key store API. Key store has specific flags that will indicate whether there's a secure element enabled. It will, you'll essentially not handle the encryption of your data or handle the keys. Very important is the keys, right? A lot of side channel attacks targets leaking cryptographic keys because then you can decrypt everything. Your keys never leave the secure element. And the best secure elements, if you actually put your money down and you spend money on them, they will have completely separate memory. They'll have completely separate everything. It's pretty much a separate uh, SOC so, uh, system on a chip inside the board. There's still voltage-based attacks you can do, but there's actually government standards, um, common criteria that make uh, modifying, they do physical side channel testing on these chips. And a lot of this has started because of Spectre back in 2016. That said, I think a lot of this work is still important, the side channel attack work, because Apple's M1 chip, I was so surprised when I figured out they did do this. Uh, and that's why a lot of people, I think, are talking about the fact that Apple rolled their own hardware for that, which is, it's a, it's a profit to Apple to do that, but then you kind of miss out on talking to chipset vendors like NXP that manufacture secure elements. Uh, and that was a complete aside from kernel exploits, which we won't talk about too much today. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that's an awesome question. Uh, I'll let you finish. Uh, okay, so the question was, what is the alternative to trust zone? There's multiple different directions that our people are taking right now. The big one for Google is they're looking at what's called essentially the Android virtualization framework, which is at this hypervisor level, and what you do is you can think of the hypervisor as something which can treat, if you ever worked with Docker, you know, Docker containers, you can start up an operating system in a Docker container, and then you can run like multiple instances of different operating systems across, across your PC. A hypervisor works very similarly. And the idea on Android's behalf is what if we take all this sort of semi-sensitive programs and applications and put them into their own virtual machine? And that's Android virtualization framework. And that's why Rust is a big deal right now, especially for Google. All the Android virtualization framework is built in Rust on top of KVM. And it's the alternative trust to trust zone. So a lot of people don't trust trust zone, surprisingly. <laughs> um, and the alternative is to run everything in a separate virtual machine. To clarify why that's important, it's because trust zone is just a single bit in your processor, whereas the where, whereas the virtual machine is like a whole entire context switch for all the registers. Uh, in ARM, there's things called system control registers, and there's uh, particularly what's called a translation control register, or TCR, which handles when you dereference a pointer and it's got a virtual memory address, it maps that pointer to physical memory. So before you dereference a pointer, the uh, ARM chip will check the translation control register, and there's something very similar on Intel, and most newer microarchitectures have something look in the translation control register and it'll do a bunch of checks about the environment before it even allows you to dereference that pointer. Uh, and so there's a whole ecosystem built up to support things like the system control registers, whereas trust zone is just a single bit in the architecture. Uh, and so it's like giving a lot of uh, permissions to trust zone. So that ideally you just like do a completely different CPU context. Um, I have my reservations about AVF, but uh, it's the current direction at least. Yeah. So like not exactly because we've kind of gotten ourselves into a bit of technical debt here where now we've got essentially bits at the peripheral level for like your fingerprint sensor and for your nfc chip that are like is this executing in a trusted mode and it's not exactly wired up to the specific VM that's executing. Uh, so the the issue there is like, you've got a bunch of existing solutions that are built around the idea of trust zone. So we can't go away from trust zone entirely. And now the game is, can we put the trust zone applications or what trust zone can see into its own isolated container? Like if you have the trust zone bit enabled, you still have the VM ID bits inside the chip as well. And the VM ID bits are actually going to, I believe, take precedence over the trust zone bits. 
uh, that's with a heavy asterisk, right? It turns out that a lot of this implementation details is entirely proprietary to the chipset manufacturer. So for instance, Samsung's rolling out their own ARM chip. Uh, Qualcomm has their own ARM chip. MediaTek has their own ARM chip. NXP has their own ARM chips. ARM has their own ARM chips. So the, the issue there is when you start getting into the weeds like that, you have to look at the bearer log and ask the chipset manufacturer, hey, uh, which of these are you doing? Like, what is what is important? I will say that for the most part, Trust Zone is operating at EL1. So EL2 has strict precedence over Trust Zone. Um, and you could even imagine that Trust Zone would become obsolete if you had a proper EL2 isolation solution. The issue is that once you start trying to do things properly, the world becomes a lot more complicated place. Um, yeah, so that's... <laughs> Lots of questions, but I'm just trying to tell you like everything that I've learned over the past year. Uh, it's really crazy when we can talk more about the things. But we talked today about kernel threats. Okay, so even if you look at 2023 Linux Foundation Security Summit videos, they claim that there are systems like uh, Samsung's real-time kernel protection that completely mitigate a lot of kernel exploits because they function as like a secure hypervisor. Uh, then you start looking at exploits in the wild and you realize like they're using way different stuff to, to, to actually get control of the system. There's a lot of things we can talk about today and we'll go into them. Um, but there's honestly so much that all I can say is just start digging and you will find something. You can look at recent CVEs, you can look at full chain exploits, which we'll go through today, and then we'll start to, we'll just see what we find and then we can go from there. So let's just start digging in and let's let's look at like how people exploit the kernel for real. Uh, so the classic attack vector is hardware manipulation. Uh, particularly what you're going after is a memory write, write gadget. And what we will see is there's a specific sort of type set of resources that you want to modify with your memory write gadget. But I want to start from basis, like what is a memory write gadget from the name suggests is you find some curl code that has a bug in it that allows you to control the address of a write. And that is all you need to exploit the kernel right now. Um, and we'll get into why that is, but generally, you just need to find some case where the code is doing something wrong, like a USS after free, a buffer overflow, and then figure out a way to get it to write to something it shouldn't, and then you can exploit the kernel. There's lots of defenses that have been implemented, like control flow integrity, to ensure that the only code that it can execute is kernel code. But as we'll see as we go through this talk, a lot of those have started to break down because the kernel 10 years ago, when a lot of these things got implemented, is very different from the kernel and how it operates today. Uh, we ran into this issue of we just kept adding features to the kernel, and now we don't have the same guarantees that we thought we had. Uh, and we'll talk about this. Okay. First, let's talk about an actual exploit, because I really do want to keep this rooted in empirical uh, evidence. So in, in 2021, five of the Android zero days that were like full stack exploits, each full stack exploit, get, attaching a monetary value to it, you can probably get around $200,000 for it. Five of them targeted GPU drivers. Drivers, um, And the reason for this is because GPU drivers have a number of ioctals or system calls that you can make as a kind of unprivileged process or a semi-privileged process to gain control of a, uh, of a device, right? So they're, they're, uh, they're very accessible to lots of different processes. So you can find a, a place to stage your exploit. And then second is that because the GPU does uh, direct memory access for speed, at least a lot of them typically do, they have very fine grained and very complex and uh, powerful control over me memory resources. A uh, direct memory address is essentially the kernel says, hey, peripheral device, you can write to any region in this memory just directly if you want. And then the peripheral device will just stream inputs into that DMA region. And it's a way that you can do things very quickly. Uh, but setting up that DMA region requires having fine-grained control over some kernel memory resources. Um, and there's very interesting, so I, we kind of touched on this with Trust Zone. A lot of the 
present work in this domain looks at restricting hardware abstraction layers and restricting where peripheral devices can, can write to. But we'll start to see that it's not necessarily the restriction of the peripheral device or like what the peripheral device can access. That's so much the issue as it is bugs in the drivers themselves. Um, so let's talk about an example of the GPU CVV CVE. This is on 5.4 branch of the uh, Qualcomm kernel. MSM kernel is the major kernel for mobile devices. Uh, we're now tie on kernel version 6.1, but most devices are actually running kernel versions 5.10 and 5.15. Uh, and it really has to do with the update cycle for Android. A really critical thing to understand about the kernel ecosystem is a CVE gets published publicly. And we now know about how to exploit that CVE. And I want to ask a question. How long do you think it takes for... Okay, so a CVE gets published in the current Linux kernel version, which is 6.18. What do we think happens next? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Exactly. You have to then take time, and it can be a long time, to backport that patch to long-term support versions of the kernel. Which, like, what what runs long-term support versions? I imagine like no no uh, no product developer or like anybody would want to do that, right? And then you also have to publicize that that patch is available on the long-term support versions. And then, uh, and you can imagine then what happens. Okay, so let's get into this. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, just to clarify that last point. Is that not included in the vulnerability disclosure timeline that before the actual CD is made public, patches are, the developers are given time to develop patches and backport those patches before like open season on seeing who can develop and exploit from or uh, kernel version? Yeah, that would be, that. that's how it should happen. But that's not how it actually no. <laughs> um, and this is not secret knowledge. Uh, there was a talk at the Linux Security Summit uh, in 2023 on hot VPF++, where the whole basis for the talk was this, was actually the fact that like, uh, you can squat on the Linux kernel mailing lists, and you have a system that you love and you know, and you just sit there and you wait, <laughs> and then you figure it out. Um, and that's why these hypervisor protections and trust zone protections and these other things that we'll talk about today are so important is because those workflow and timeline delay issues are not specific to any manufacturer. They are pervasive across the ecosystem. And vendors that are not using like the Linux kernel or an open source process to manage this are even worse off. So like, I just, I don't wanna know the backporting process of like, of actually, I will not name any names, but but you can imagine that there are studies way back in the past that looked at Windows update routines, for example, and found that most Windows updates take months to propagate to all machines, et cetera. Um, so that's a little bit of background on the ecosystem and why this is important. We'll talk about a specific exploit now. So. The case here was there was a syscall uh, that you can make to a GPU driver, and it would allow you to access to the direct memory access fence uh, after its ref, ref count reached zero. So using this, you could essentially ma manipulate that uh, resource. Uh, sorry, you could have the GPU driver have access to something that was supposed to be freed and then manipulate that thing that was supposed to be freed such that you get a right gadget to an arbitrary place in kernel memory. So that's like one example of how you might find an exploit is you go into the system call handlers for a specific driver, you figure out, hey, this driver has a race condition where you can maybe free this thing, and then another part of the code in the driver will still access to that, to that thing. Um, and then we see it again, right? So it's, it was existing in another one of these CVU, CVEs, where there was another ioctal, which is just a syscall. If you're not familiar with syscalls, they are just CPU interrupts. You put your parameters to the system call into registers, and then you fire an interrupt, and you do int number, forget what the number is off the top of my head. What was it? Uh, it is, I think it's x80 on, on Intel, uh, on x86. It's yeah. been a little while. Uh, yeah. I, thankfully, I don't have to program so much assembly anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it's very easy to fire a syscall. And there's syscaller, which is the fuzzer for system calls. 
And that's why says caller exists is because they want to find stuff like this and they're constantly finding things like this. Um, so there was a so there was a syscall which had a race condition which would uh, essentially you could trigger a free of some structs and then you do heap spraying, which if you're not familiar with heap spraying is when you use a struct in memory, you allocate a page in memory for that struct. You make a malloc call. And then you would free that ref free that resource using free. And then if you have a use after free, you're going to dereference some pointer in that struct, out, even though it's already freed. What an attacker can then do is they can then make repeated syscalls to some other GPU driver and claim a bunch of pages for their process, including the page which is referenced by that dangling pointer, and then load memory into that dangling pointer, and then fire another syscall. It then accesses that dangling pointer, and then it goes and writes to some kernel kernel resource. That's generally the exploit path that you're looking at there. So it's like you want to find a syscall to use something after treat, and a syscall to to load up the the heap. So this was a recent big CVE that came out. Um, I will send my slides. Uh, to Sigpony after this to make sure they're accessible on the site. Because I've got I've got links to the Google Project Zero blog from 2023 uh 09, so last September, that talks about this exact exploit and how it was how it was able to be used. Um but you'll notice in both of these cases, they're just write gadgets, right? Uh and really the write gadget from my experience so far is the critical critical kind of point. If you can find some way to write to a kernel resource, you are good. And that's literally all you got to do. Um, so let's talk about why that's so important. Um, now that we got a feeling for like kind of how current kernel exploits look, let's talk about what write gadget gets you. Um, so 10 years ago, I think uh, maybe even a little bit earlier. I think it, I think it was 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Samsung invented this thing called real-time kernel protection, and they claimed that. Well, the paper didn't explicitly claim too much, but then people kind of misread the paper afterwards, and there was a lot of misunderstanding of what a contemporary, like what kernel exploits actually look like. What it did was it marked all code and read-only data pages as strictly immutable. And it claimed to also lock the page tables responsible for, for managing these pages. If you're not familiar with the virtual memory architecture, right, virtual address needs to translate to a physical address because you might have less physical memory than your virtual memory. Like your virtual pointer is 64 bits, but you might only have four gigabytes of physical memory. And so you can't reference, you need to swap pages in and out in order to, to have a like fake representation of a 64-bit pointer. Uh, and that's useful because it just makes programming easier. Anyways, that's all managed through page tables. RKB claimed to lock down page tables. Uh, maybe it worked at the time that they published it, but certainly on modern chipsets, there are race conditions and all sorts of problems with locking down page tables. Uh, not, in, not the least of which is uh, modern file systems do a thing called a zip compression. We, uh, so there's like a thing called EROFS, and EROFS is to reduce memory pressure on a system, your pages are actually zipped. Uh, and then when you load them into memory, you dynamically unzip them. Uh, you can imagine why this is like a problem if you want to mark the page tables as strictly immutable, because you need to actually modify the page tables in the process to do the unzipping. Um, but it's absolutely critical, especially on memory constrained systems. Uh, and there's Another, there's so many other things in the kernel that completely break these basic assumptions. Uh, and so a lot of the work on the kernel nowadays is just trying to get back to the world where we could say something like RKP exists. Um, but that said, what's weirdly happened is now that a lot of the existing like security summit talks and things like this assume that RKP exists, kernel exploits have started to target different resources. You can imagine one of those, the core one, is dynamic data structures. So there's things in the kernel called kernel worker queues. And these are linked lists that include function pointers. And you call a function call to load something into the worker queue. And then that worker queue gets processed. And then it calls a function pointer in the worker queue and then executes that code. 
Um, so what's bad about this as like a, a small check? And it says it right there. Well, what's bad about this is it's completely dynamic. There is very little way that you can mark it immutable uh, because you need to be able to load work into the work queue dynamically. That's the whole point of a work queue. Not only that, but it glazes over the literally thousands and thousands of dynamically allocated data structures and pointers to critical devices like the TRNG. Uh, so I will bring this up just briefly. Uh, so I'll, I'll do kind of code, dev, uh, Linux, find dot dash name star uh, k all sims. Uh, um, sorry, I need to do the, okay, so, Oh, so there's there's different um, there's different boundaries. So uh, I'm about to get to it. I just want to I want to bring it up uh, real quick. So when you compile a when you compile a binary uh, and you compile with debugging symbols enabled, each of those uh, structs or things in memory are um, are loaded into the file and they have a unique virtual address associated with them. Typically it's like global variables and things like that. And you have multiple types of ver uh, global variables, some of which are structures which are dynamically allocated using malloc and then you assign some value to that to that piece of memory. Um, and so in the kernel, how we delineate resources is we have our code section, our dot text section, we have our dot read our read only data section, which is marked by literally the underscore underscore end read only data symbol. And then you have your section for dynamically allocated resources. And dynamically allocated resources are the ones that kernel exploits target nowadays, because those are the ones that are strictly mutable. Like they have to be mutable for the kernel to function. And I bring this up as just a list of um, all the different non-read-only data symbols that are in the kernel. Like it goes on and on and on and on. These are text, but these these are the actual uh, symbols. So, I mean, it's very easy to go through your favorite device driver, figure out, oh, well, it has a global pointer that's stored at this offset that I've leaked through some other exploit. And I can just write to that and cause something to happen in the kernel that I want to, want to happen. Um, okay, getting to the moral of the story here, right? is that each one of these dynamically allocated data structures has a different semantics associated with it. For example, the pointer to your t current TRNG device, true run random number generator device, has a particular semantics, which is correct versus incorrect. Um, but understanding that individual semantics is important because you need to determine whether a write to that resource is malicious or not. Um, the idea being that the open problem is people are going to find write gadgets. They will find some driver that they can modify to write to one of these kernel resources. Uh, and then you want to prevent that write from causing some manipulation in the kernel. We've got all these resources that are directly writable from the kernel uh, and don't you don't know what they do or what they are. And so it's just an open problem of like, sure, we could lock down things like security enhanced Linux, like the task structure in the kernel. Task structure is what's associated with each process in the kernel. It's what determines whether the process is root user or not. You can change the like the privilege level of a process through that. That is something that's typically locked down by things like RKP. But who cares about the task structure when you have literally thousands of other data structures that you can go and write to, right? Like it is it is very, very easy once you have a write gadget to find some kernel resource that is not marked immutable entirely and go and manipulate it and use it to gain more control over the over the kernel. Yes. So then with these write gadgets, like just to reiterate, you're going to write to a resource in the kernel from like in kernel mode then? Yes. And then you write to the in kernel mode and then you're able to get access to whatever you want. Exactly. Yeah. So, and you would just write to one of these addresses. So because of address space layout randomization, 
finding these addresses is a little bit more um, difficult, but typically with your write gadget, you also need to pair something to break address space layout randomization, but breaking address space layout randomization is very, very easy, um, at least right now. Um, function, or? It's based upon a seed that gets generated at boot time. And uh, that's actually where a lot of the side channel research is actually really super useful is because you can leak some information about the address space layout and then use that to stage one of these exploits. Um, cool. So yes. And yeah, so number of VMAP nodes, this is like extremely, extremely critical. This is your virtual memory map nodes. This is what determines virtual memory in your system. Yeah. Uh, when you say describe like semantics, would that be like any process of like, like, would you add a hook to like, be like, this write is invalid, or this write is valid? Exactly. Yeah, that's the tough part. So there's recent work at Usenix Security, which tried to do exactly sort of this. And the way that they're doing it is they're trying to instrument every single kernel function and kind of have a lock unlock mechanism for the data structures that it accesses. But when you go to watch Linux Foundation, like uh, YouTube videos and things, a lot of the people will bring up um, the invariance, data structure invariance inside the kernel. And this is what they're talking about is the, the really critical thing is exactly that, is figuring out what is the invariant of this data structure that I can enforce that will kind of guarantee that the right to it is not is not dangerous. Um, so, and that's very difficult to do to do generally. It's so fast. Because there's so many symbols and these resources need to be writable, at least within some context in order for the kernel to function. Because you have people that you write, when you write C, you add a, you add a global variable that like tracks some, some system state and that's, that's all you need to, to do this. Um, there are so many, potential promising directions. But I guess my point here is that it's still an open problem. Um, so uh, let me go back to the talk. Um, and how much time am I? I know that we're, we started a little bit late, so I'm going to take a couple extra minutes if that's okay. Yeah. I planned for like 50 minutes. Um, so thankfully we did a lot of the talk about this. Uh, we talked a lot about this. One of the things that you might think about is write XOR execute. Uh, but the problem, we can go into this maybe after the talk, is that write extra execute works at the time that a page is marked writable. You cannot execute from it. But there are many, many subsystems in the kernel which will mark a page writable, write code to it, and then mark it executable, and then execute from it. And so, for example, BPF, you hear this catchphrase BPF, it stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. Uh, we should actually talk about this. Um, so going into this, going into this thing, because let me, let me back up a step. You get the right gadget in the kernel. You corrupt one of these kernel resources. What do you do next? You want to get some code executing to get code executing in the kernel. You need to stage that code into the kernel somehow, right? Because you essentially, because of CFI and these other things, the existing kernel code is locked down well enough that it's just going to make your life harder. You could still manipulate the kernel using existing kernel code and do just fine. Uh, but it's oftentimes much easier to gain full control of the system by staging some bytecode into some region of memory and jumping to that bytecode. And that's kind of where I want to start taking this conversation. I hope it makes sense that we're trying, I'm trying to go from the very, very high level of how things work uh, and then go all the way down through an entire exploit chain. Because once you find one of these exploit chains, you can you too can make $200,000. Um, okay. So let's talk about the big one, uh, eBPF. Since we're a Berkeley packet filter, uh, Berkeley packet filter was originally used only for networking. Uh, classic BPF programs are things like translating IPv4 packets to IPv6 packets, so you can run on an IPv6 network even though your device is only communicating in IPv4. But in doing so, it exposed a bunch of interfaces to these things called K probes. And K probes were actually developed at Motorola. Uh, so we kind of are a little bit at fault for this, but K probes are the debugging interface to the kernel. K probes uh, use the kernel self patching interface, which is one of the most dangerous interfaces in the kernel, which I cannot believe exists. But the kernel allows you to patch code anywhere you want. <laughs> um, 
and modify instructions in memory. And that serves as a support framework for this called thing called eBPF. And eBPF is a monster that was built off of what was supposed to be for networking, but is now misused by every system application ever to do whatever task it wants. There is stuff in eBPF for managing GPUs. There's stuff in eBPF typically for managing network resources like firewalls, but also there's just an BPF load prog or prog run system call that if you have BPF privileges enabled on your system uh, or BPF enabled on your system, you can load arbitrary BPF programs into, into memory. And I'll give you an example of an exploitable BPF program in a, in a moment. Um, so a lot of systems have opted, uh, particularly Red Hat Enterprise Linux, to disallow unprivileged BPF access. Uh, but that's actually not the case in many systems. And it's a very bad thing. And I even sent an email to the Android kernel maintainers and said, please do not allow unprivileged programs to run the BPF syscall. Uh, and they said, no, this is protected through the Android JNI. The Android JNI is that containerization interface for APKs. Um, but the JNI only has a strict partitioning scheme between what are called system level, system signed APKs, and what are called user level, user APKs. Things in the system level APKs include the entire Android Bluetooth stack. Um, so, or like the entire Android cell phone stack, or the entire settings app, or the, so if any one of these things is exploitable, they can make BPF system calls and then use BPF to load and stage code into the kernel and then do one of these other, other things. So, so I'm kind of ragging on BPF here, but I will also acknowledge that BPF is essentially a thin wrapper around uh, kernel module allocation interface. And there's all sorts of issues with kernel modules and allocating kernel modules as well. Um, cool. So briefly, let's look at current BPF exploits. Currently BPF exploits, focus on loading a BPF program where you essentially get access to one of these other apps. There's thousands, like at least 40 of them uh, that are just off the top of my head, many more. And these are on all sorts of systems, not just Android. These are on most enterprise Linux systems like cloud services, et cetera. Um, you find access to one of these programs through like uh, some code execution in that program, like an Apache server, and then you use BPF to get full root access to the machine. Right, because user space programs are not necessarily run as root, and actually they shouldn't be run as root. But then if they have access to the BPF system call, now they have the ability to run some programs as, as root. Um, so that's why unprivileged is disabled, but not every system actually disables un unprivileged BPF. Hopefully my point is clear. Uh, let's get into an exploit, right? So I wrote this very quickly. Um, and the one thing that people don't talk about is how BPF programs are vulnerable. Uh, so, BPF is a special case in the kernel that's very interesting uh, in that it doesn't have CFI. It doesn't have any of the modern memory protections, at least on ARM. Intel just implemented CFI for BPF. And actually part of my job over the next few months is to try to implement CFI for ARM on BPF. But right now, BPF is pretty much C and it can have buffer overflow exploits. And the difference is if you have a buffer overflow exploit in the Linux kernel, there is something called LLVM CFI, which means that you can't modify the stack pointer very easily. You can, you have a stack canary and it will prevent your buffer overflow from being able to create a return oriented programming chain, et cetera. BPF has none of that, right? So here's a vulnerable BPF program. It is two lines long, just to demonstrate a point. You run this uh, function called BPF pro breed. Note here that this the pointer value, uh, that's the third argument to that function is marked as unsafe in the BPF API. We could very easily call this function because you saw it in other BPF programs without realizing that the parameter name is unsafe. Uh, and then you can do trace print K. And if you've ever seen a format string injection, this is breaking KSLR, KASLR right here. So who needs a side channel when you've got a BPF program loaded on your kernel where they're doing something like this? Or you can use it to essentially look at packet handling code and, and do. There's lots of things like this, unfortunately. Um, so that's very cool. Brief aside about printk. When I was an undergrad, I took security class. We did format string vulnerabilities as a as a programming assignment, and they said there's this percent n specifier that allows you to write to memory, 
uh, and that no longer exists. Like they cut that out of most kernel assembly loaders like many years ago. Uh, so right now, printk and format string vulnerabilities, they're mainly used for breaking KSLR, right? They, they serve as a first stage exploit. Uh, but I didn't realize that until I wrote one. And then I realized, oh, I can't use percent %n on like the modern kernel. Uh, so that's a just side. Okay, so wrapping up, um, we talked a little bit about write then execute problems. There's active work in the Linux kernel. Uh, working on this, actually, I made commits recently and they got me invited to the Linux Foundation Memory Management uh, Summit. So that's very cool, which indicates that this is a real problem and we're hopefully, like just this weekend, I was working on patching it. Uh, but the issue is that right now, it is almost impossible to lock down kernel page tables because of bad intermixing between address space layout randomization and and other facets of, of how memory is allocated in the kernel. We can talk more about it after the talk's over. I was hoping that we'd have more time, but uh, that's that that can this is more recap now of, of existing things. So we talked about some of the dynamic memory problems. I think a lot of people are looking to Rust, and this is why Rust is a big deal, because you've got ownership in Rust. And you can say, I own this resource until I don't own this resource. And so you can start mixing in kind of like, OK, this, this resource is owned by this particular section of the code. But even Torvalds has said recently that uh, he's in the wait and see camp about Rust. It's not clear whether the whole kernel will be rewritten in Rust. There's just so much C code, so much active development in C that it's hard to know whether Rust will, will make a complete complete takeover. And then Rust itself has exploits in the in, um in some of the typically in the dependencies and and in how the compiler handles certain certain primitives and a lot of the Rust standard lib has unsafe directives inside of it so you can hack those those uh, functions. So there's another thing that's very interesting. Um, it's how stack protections are implemented in ARM. It's uh, pointer authentication codes, which is essentially you mix in a hash with a pointer before you dereference it when it's on the stack. And right now it's for stack integrity and CFI, but potentially there's something you could do there to protect these dynamic resources where it's like, actually all this code that accesses these specific pointers or structs, we're going to mix in some hash and you need to know that key or else you can't, you can't access it. Um, or something you come up with. So I'm hoping the goal of this talk is like, here's a bunch of the stuff I've learned over the past year. I started realizing, I was like, I am in way over my head. And actually the kernel is in way over its head. And the benefit of this is that there's a lot to do and there's a lot of interesting research. And I'm hoping that because we talked over all of this, that you'll be able to go start digging into Linux kernel, go look at device drivers, go look at these use after free exploits that are actively being used and try to build protections or refinements on top of them. Because it really is something that's needed and it's something that is been a continued problem and it's not going to be solved until people take the time to try to implement systems to prevent these exploits. Um, so we talked about AVF and microkernels. So there's there's multiple uh, different works that are coming out right now that are using uh, BPF to try to protect kernel resources. We talked about the virtualization approach. Um, but there's a lot of different approaches to this problem of solving kernel exploits generally. I've kind of been of the opinion that we should try to solve the problem at its root. So we looked at that vulnerable BPF program, and we looked at the fact that you can kind of load your own BPF pro programs and use them to exploit the kernel. I don't think the solution to that is to use more BPF to secure BPF. I think the solution is to implement what we already have for dynamically loaded kernel modules, where you can do integrity checks. So before you inject code into the kernel using BPF, check the cryptographic signature on that code, at least. That would be a great uh, forward step. And uh, additionally, like if you want to go the Google approach, you could put these dynamically loaded BPF programs into their own environment, where they can't access these other dynamic kernel resources and potentially hack the rest of the kernel because of their elevated privilege. Uh, so that's what this slide is about. This slide is a mess. I apologize for that, but it's just wrapping up kind of the general uh, general gist of a lot of lot of things. So 
hopefully today you've gone on a full journey from like user space program to complete root control over the Linux kernel using exploits that were released in the last year. Uh, so, and we learned a lot about the ecosystem and how the ecosystem might allow you to use these exploits for a long time. And we've also gone into the open problems and the work that you should be doing, which is not necessarily always developing exploits, but also looking at exploits critically and saying, how can we build systems to protect all these critical resources? Um, so if you want to uh, drop me an email or ask about any of this, ask about which parts of the Linux kernel you should contribute to, or projects that would be relatively easy to kind of get started on this stuff, please email me at either of these emails and I'll send the slides to uh, the Sig Pony team and hopefully you'll be able to see those. And yeah, thank you so much for, for coming out to the talk and listening to me uh, for a little bit. Cool. Um, oh, and lastly, I should thank Levchenko because uh, he was my advisor during my PhD. And during the time of my PhD, I did not understand why uh, he was having me do a lot of things that I was doing. And now I completely understand. <laughs> I completely understand uh, because the work, the kernel is currently a bit on of on fire, and it's uh, something that should probably be fixed, hopefully, before a ransomware attack happens. That uh, another ransomware attack happens, I guess. Okay, so thank you. Uh, and with that, any questions or anything like that? And it can be on anything. It doesn't have to just be about Linux kernel exploits. Yes, I just finished uh, the interview process for internships for this this summer, and we're going down the the list of applicants. Um, we are going to have internships next summer, and I'm trying to expand the security team at Motorola. So you should definitely, definitely apply to Motorola so you can do research on the Linux kernel and work with Google and work with all the Qualcomm and all these people to fix the world. Uh, and we have full times too. Uh, right now we're trying to set up a pipeline where we do internships as kind of a vetting stage and then we do full time after that. Uh, particularly for next summer, we're going to be looking for people that are like graduating, uh, that of course, uh, but also I'm just always, I kind of, this year I pushed the team to say, if a person, we really went down the list and I said, this person's really good. It doesn't matter whether they're full-time or not, let's, let's extend them the offer. So I think uh, that's that's awesome. Okay, cool. That's the internship question, yeah. What if like, so you're at Motorola right now, mm -hmm. what specifically about the position that you're in right now do you feel like really enables you to learn a lot about this? Like why not, why Motorola or why where you are? Yeah, so it has to do a little bit with the fact that I did the PhD. <laughs> Um, and so when I was hired, it was because, you know, I think that the Motorola started doing an investment where as a company, they want to overtake Apple and Samsung. And they realized that their security research program was more lightweight than either Apple or Samsung or Google. And so I was brought on as kind of the first hire to be like, Motorola wants to be serious about security research. And it's been a really fun process. Um, it's been a mixture of working on this and submitting patches to Linux kernel and then trying to eventually get publications out and things like that, as well as rework our security stance and try to build like a security.motorola.com where we can talk about these things, uh, as well as realizing that there's a lot of hand waving and a lot of vaporware that goes on in security. And it's really unfortunate because these things are very real. And once you start digging into them, you realize that there's a lot of people that are like, have been working on this for the past 10 years and they're knocking on closed doors. And then once that door opens, they then have to work to maintain that door so that it's open. Um, but I think that it's been great joining Motorola because they've kind of given me a lot of freedom to say, we want to make the phones even better. And how do we do that? And unfortunately, what I discovered was a lot of problems were not Motorola specific. It was these things about the Linux kernel that we talked about today, where you have these dynamically K worker queues that people are actively writing exploits for that you can find blog posts and GitHub articles exploiting K worker queues. And there's nobody patching the Linux kernel. So uh, companies will claim and they'll say, we've got 
some kernel protection. Researchers will say, well, we got some kernel protection, but then you go and you go to the kernel and you say, where's the commit at, right? Uh, so regardless of whether you work at Motorola or not, I highly suggest you always try to open source your contributions and submit them to somebody maintainers because they already have their hands so full and it's the only way that we're going to push computer science forward really is to have those, those contributions. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Any questions about the technical details and things like that? Yeah. I have a small question on why you consider the EV debt program vulnerable. It seems like like the program itself is vulnerable, not the EV of EVP at runtime. It just mm -hmm. like like it yeah. just seemed like a poorly written program. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's there's two sides of this. One is one is the run. There's actually there's three sides to this. One is the EBPF, eBPF runtime and verifier, and there's plenty of papers and exploits on the BPF verifier, but it's undergoing constant vetting to make sure that you can't load a BPF program that doesn't pass the verifier. The verifier ensures or is supposed to ensure that your code doesn't have things like buffer overflows. So that's one side of it, and you would expect like that would solve everything. Um, however, there, are, I guess the point of this slide is to say that there are still unsafe primitives in BPF. And I have very recently, like there's certain parts of, thankfully they're patched now, but there's certain packet handling routines that might use those unsafe primitives and you might need to go patch those. Uh, so there's, there's the aspect of BPF programs that are loaded that are using these unsafe primitives, but not necessarily format string injection, but rather copying to certain buffers to manipulate other system resources uh, where they can get it to pass the verifier, but it can still be unsafe. Um, and then the third one, third side of this is the potential for loading BPF programs. Uh, and BPF programs, because they can have access to the K-probe interface and to kernel self-patching, um, they can, uh, they, if you've got access to the BPF syscall, you can, you can, then you have pretty much control over the kernel. Uh, and it can be, there are some restrictions, for example, in the Android runtime for which BPF uh, features are enabled for which components in the ecosystem. And there will be delineations of like, this application is loaded in this file system partition. So it can have access to the K-Broker interface for BPF. This other one can't. But fundamentally, there's so many applications that are running in each one of these partitions that it's it's almost like a it's a moot point because if you already have 50 applications that are undergoing constant code updates from developers that may or may not be at all involved in security it doesn't it's still yeah it, it's it's enough of a threat surface that you can just go find one of those exploits and that's exactly what people do so uh, i didn't have it on these slides but in 2022 com.android.bluetooth have had a code execution exploit com.android.bluetooth is signed as a system level app. Com.android.bluetooth can make the BPF system call. Com.android.bluetooth can load a BPF program into the kernel with K probes, modify kernel code that's actively running and get complete control over the entire system. And it's critical to understand that the uh, just because you have protections like trust zone in place or hypervisor protections in place, doesn't mean that if you have EL1 or operating system privileges, you can't display things to the screen that would completely corrupt the device or get you more privileges or figure out some files in memory, et cetera. Yeah. Go ahead. Like in your example, you had that um, a lot of the exploits were in GPU drivers. Mm -hmm. um, what are most of the exploits that you've seen from CVEs in device drivers specifically, or are they in like specific kernel? Um, device drivers are a very, very common route. Uh, I would say when we say most CVEs, it's, it's really difficult because you have to look at the specific subsystem for which the CVEs are being reported. So you'd look at something like BPF has a list of CVEs that occur in it. Device drivers have a list of CVEs that occur in it. And, uh, and APKs even have their own list of CVEs or just user applications like LS. Uh, LS probably doesn't have many CVs much anymore, but at one point. Uh, so 
I think it's important to look at what are called Android Zero Days. And for Android Zero Days, certainly those have a lot of device drivers just because iOctals are easily accessible resource. Uh, but I don't necessarily want to distract away from the numerous other parts of the stack, like the modem binary, right? That could that totally have CVs. Every single month, Qualcomm rolls out a huge patch list of like, here's seven different memory exploits that we found in the modem code. Uh, so that's a whole side of it too. Uh, and it's it's weird when you start to get to classify it as a peripheral or a driver. It's I guess there are binary blobs that get loaded onto the peripheral device, and there's drivers in the kernel that manage communication with the peripheral device. And then there's kernel CVs themselves too, right? So things like the memory management subsystem doesn't properly handle uh, some some buffer addressing or whatever, uh, and those are a whole side of it. Uh, yeah. Or typically race conditions would be the big kernel exploits nowadays. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yes. Can you talk about the data flow of, let's say, a user land application system like the, the modem chip in the new model without cross Um, like What would that access pattern look like? Yeah. So, so the trusted bit in the ARM CPU would likely still be used, but the idea is that they would use KVM, which is the hypervisor. The hypervisor provides a microkernel for each separate critical application on the on the system. And we can get into all that, but let's talk about particularly payment, right? So you want to go use your credit card to do something. It's a really critical thing. In a payment app, you would run that payment app as an APK inside a microkernel. The microkernel would interface the a version of the Linux operating system with many of the system calls removed from it and maybe only expose interfaces for speaking to this particular uh, peripheral device. Eventually, I think the idea is like you tailor the microkernel just for that application. So you could really lock down its access to these, these peripherals. But the data flow would be, I go to um, read from a corrupted NFC reader. It sends me a datagram that somehow causes a buffer overflow inside the Java native code interface inside that app. Then that Java native code interface, you get some code executing within it by bypassing, typically by writing to dynamic resource, overriding a function pointer, and figuring out some other CFI bypass. It's a whole whole thing, right? Once you do that, and you've got your code executing as that app, then you would make a system call or an ioctal that's vulnerable like these GPU uh, ones within the microkernel context, and then potentially try to use up some resource and get executing as the, the microkernel. But even though you corrupted the microkernel, you might have access to those peripherals, but those peripherals would be gated by the hypervisor still, right? So under the normal execution model, if you did this whole exploit in the regular kernel, you would be able to access that peripheral memory directly because there's no hypervisor partitioning of the peripherals. Uh, in this case, you might be able to corrupt one microkernel, but you wouldn't be able to access the other peripherals on the device. And then potentially from there, you could uh, you could try to do better introspection of what the microkernel is doing and maybe lock down that peripheral interface even more. It's a difficult question because for any system that gets implemented, you could potentially find a lot of workarounds for it. Uh, but the idea is you just want to establish at least some isolation. The problem is the current model doesn't provide any isolation. All trust zone apps are in the same context. So if you've got the trusted bit set, then you have as much privilege as the payment app. And that's a problem, right? So, so I think that, the, that it's mainly set to just like push the ball a little bit further down the court, but not necessarily score a uh, sla uh, slam dunk. <laughs> yeah. To use a basketball metaphor, yeah. Um, I don't know which kernel version it was introduced in, but given that the is IOE ring of interest to Android security researchers because I've heard in later newer versions of the kernel, that's a pretty big source of vulnerabilities. Uh, also, like in, in the same line as um, peripheral uh, device uh, driver exploits. Yeah, I, from what I've seen, it's kind of a hands down, if you can get a right gadget, it doesn't matter how you get it. Um, so, in the past, I think generally developers will look at what has had CVEs previously, 
And if IOU ring has had CVEs previously, then developers will look again at that thing for CVEs. Um, I feel like the Linux kernel is doing a better and better job of trying to patch the existing subsystems that are part of the core kernel and not part of the drivers because there's a lot of maintainer familiarity with those subsystems. And it's only when a new subsystem gets introduced, like BPF, new, even though it's super old, right? That you start to see more vulnerabilities in the core kernel components. What makes device drivers so juicy is that everyone can implement their own device driver and there's thousands of devices. And so it's like, if I want to exploit this particular IoT device, I'd look for the device, devices on the IoT device and find their device drivers. Because I know that that code was not as rigorously vetted by maintainers that have a lot of familiarity with how the code operates as the core kernel infrastructure. Really long answer to the question. Um, yeah. So any other questions? I do want to say one last thing, uh, and I think then we'll begin. So there's a thing called verified boot, which is integrity checks on your kernel, on your code. Uh, but one thing for thought that I want to leave you with is there's device drivers and other applications that need some per persistent configuration data to be stored across reboots. And that data needs to be written dynamically at runtime. And so even if you were to, say, ensure that your kernel cannot be rootkitted by uh, checking the cryptographic integrity of the code in that kernel. So you can't patch the kernel these days, like permanently. Once your device reboots, it reboots the same exact kernel code every single time. And it does a cryptographic integrity check on that kernel to code. That kernel code might then look at configuration files or need some persistent configuration files for which you cannot generate a cryptographic signature because they're by nature of them dynamic, just like the dynamic structs and things that get allocated in the kernel at runtime. So leave you with that thought. So next time you hear about verified boot or trusted platform modules or anything like this, you might think about, oh, well, what if, what about the system might need to run at kernel privilege and have some persistent data that it stores, which is different across reboots. And that might be how you get your rootkit to stay on a phone after you've done your whole exploit that we talked about today. And with that, I'm done. Okay. So thank you. It was like a fire hose. I, uh, yeah, I apologize that it was a lot, but it's like a year's worth of years worth of uh, work. Um, and the big thing is, this is not about going and writing exploits. It is about the fact that you should be writing the protections against these exploits. Yes. <laughs>